You are listening to Keep Canada Weird, a weekly weird news roundup by the Nighttime Podcast. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to the weekly Keep Canada Weird discussion series. If you're new here, I'm Jordan, and in Keep Canada Weird, my pal Aaron Airport and I seek out and explore some of the more offbeat news stories that played out across Canada over the past week. In tonight's episode, which was recorded on the 23rd of July, 2024, Aaron and I get attacked by electric eels at the Vancouver airport, we climb a stairway to nothing, we mediate a court case involving a romantic getaway and some Coldplay tickets, and we give a side eye to some barbershop drama in St. John's, Newfoundland. So let's get into it. Handsome Aaron Airport. It's time to keep Canada weird. I promised last week I'd stop asking what you were drinking because I was always drinking the same thing. I'm not going to ask you. I'll just tell you I do have a tea here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm going to melt your face here because I am drinking a gin smash. Oh, damn. It's going to be one of those nights. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, buckle up. Listeners, this bus is on a shaky bridge. This bus better not go below 50 miles an hour or <laughs> it's going to explode. Yes. Speaking of exploding, my inbox has exploded with a barrage of listener voicemails. People are jumping on the opportunity to take advantage of our promise to send out Keep Canada Weird correspondent stickers and badges to everyone who sends us a voicemail that gets aired on the show. I've been flooded with them, but they've been good. And I want to start with one right now. A listener named Allie, well, a correspondent named Allie from Abbotsford, BC, wants to let us know about a story we missed last week, and I'm quite ashamed of us for missing it. This has to do with an eel attack at the Vancouver airport. Hey, Jordan and Aaron, it's Ari. I have a little, I don't know, is it an animal uprising? I'm not sure, but I think it was two weeks ago, um, and you guys didn't cover it, so I don't know if you know about it, but there was like eels that got out of their container at the Vancouver airport. And they came from Toronto, I think. We don't know why. We looked it up at my lunch break. But yeah, I don't know. Is that an animal uprising? Was this a failed attempt at something? There's like very little information. But I thought that was really weird. There's like a photo of eels all over the airport, like ground. So yeah. Anyway, that's my little update all the way from over here. Keep up the good work, guys. Bye. So I would say Allie is great at finding interesting stories, but Allie doesn't strike me as a great investigator. What do you mean? What, what was your issue with her investigative efforts? I guess it gets nowhere. She couldn't call the airport. She couldn't show up there. Yeah, but maybe once she has her badge, she'll mm-hmm. be able to get into those more sensitive areas. Right now, she could say that she's a Keep Canada Weird correspondent, but they're not mm-hmm. going to believe her unless she has her badge. So what Allie needs to do is contact uh, Keep Canada Weird and give Jordan her address, and Jordan will mail her the Keep Canada Weird official badge. And she can go to the airport with it and get into the top secret situations behind the airport um no i was being uh facetious or sarcastic uh, i i think like even the mainstream press that dug into this story didn't get any further than ali did there's snakes on a plane and then there are eels on the runway video posted to social media shows dozens of eels wriggling on the tarmac at vancouver's airport a yvr spokesperson confirms it happened on monday when a cooler full of live eels spilled open while being unloaded from an Air Canada flight. The airline says the slippery passengers were quickly collected and safely repackaged. A pretty wild scene. What do you make of this? Yeah, no mention if uh, they were electric eels or not. Yeah, I never even considered that. Mm -hmm. So imagine if that were the case and all of the workers and people trying to get the eels back into the box were getting electrocuted at the same oh, time god why would you take a big thing of live eels on a plane like i i don't know a lot about this sort of thing but i have watched you know those weird like border security shows and stuff and something they're always like looking for is agricultural products or animals or raw meat and stuff it just seems like if you showed up at the airport and we're like i just got this huge cooler of giant eels that possibly are electric 
And well, someone would have ordered the eels. Like it would just be a form of delivery, you know, you like think the, you the same the... way that you would order something specific and it's going to arrive, you know, on a flight and then it's going to be shipped to your warehouse at, you know, by truck. And then it's just part of the transportation, part of the travel that a very unique delivery would take is a uh, airplane is always an option yeah, I depending guess so. on where it's coming from. Right. They said Toronto, but maybe Toronto was a, was a stopover for these yeah. eels. Ali said Toronto. I didn't see that anywhere else. That was a part of the oh, research. Oh, okay. She... Ali said Toronto. Oh, she needs a badge. She can get her, <laughs> get her facts right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, when I heard the story or when I, and when I watched this, I assumed it was a passenger who was boarding a plane. Like I have my suitcase and a huge cooler of eels that are like precariously taped up. Uh, Ali suggested this could possibly be connected to the animal uprising, something we've referred to lately as A Day, the day that it'll happen. Is it connected? Regular eels, probably not. But you made a good point there with electric eels. Could you imagine if a bunch of electric eels got loose on the plane, started screwing with the circuitry and the radar and everything else? Eh, but that's not going to be good. Well, I mean, the animals... Well, we'll say the crows, who we deem to be the top of the animal kingdom. And they're the ones pulling all the strings because uh, they would be the smartest of, of all the animals. Perhaps an experiment that the animals were doing to see if maybe electric eels could take down a plane. Mm. Last week, we heard about the lobster forces that were being deployed unsuccessfully to a roadside. We've now heard about the electric eels that ended up flopping around on the tarmac. Uh, things aren't going great for the crows, nor the animals, but uh, we'll follow this story as it continues to develop. Let's get to the meat and potatoes of our mission here, though, and that is to keep Canada weird by seeking out and exploring the weird news stories that have played out across the past week. This story that we just talked about was a bonus because that actually happened two weeks ago. We got a bunch tonight, though. We're going to spend some time on public art exhibits, which is something we enjoy talking about. We're going to hear about a nonsensical court case that played out. We're going to hear about some drama in Newfoundland. And of course, it wouldn't be an episode of Keep Canada Weird without a pet story because we got a cat here to talk about. Mm. I'm thinking let's start with the public art. What do, what do you want to do here? Yeah, let's let's dig it into some art. Like you say, we, we do cover a lot of different public art stories that, you know, strange art pieces that pop up here and there around the country. Yeah, public art exhibits are often weird. I guess just by their very nature, they're open to interpretation. They're and usually they're hiring weirdos to do this stuff. Yeah, it's true. Like the, the artist who designs like the weird metal sculpture that's in front of City Hall, it's usually a, usually a colorful person. But let's get into tonight's stories. Uh, let's start with something being referred to as Vancouver's Stairway to Nowhere. So Vancouver's Hastings Park is home to one of Canada's newest public art displays. But this one's a little bit different than your typical roadside sculpture. This one's meant to be interactive. It's officially called Home and Away, but again, most call it the Stairway to Nowhere. It's a 17 meter tall structure that took inspiration by the site's history as a sports field and is made up of 16 rows of bleacher style seating, which look like steps in a staircase from a distance. Here's some news coverage of the sculpture, and then we'll talk about it. You're not usually allowed to touch pieces of art, but a new sculpture in East Vancouver was designed to be stepped on and sat on. This is Home and Away, a 17-meter high artwork in the form of stadium bleachers. It was unveiled today at Empire Field, right outside Playland, with 16 rows. This public art can seat up to 49 people. On top of providing great views, it's meant to reflect the history of Hastings Park, where Empire Stadium once stood, and it comes with a bonus stair workout. Now we have another incredible uh, piece of art that actually will, does something that I think is extraordinarily Vancouver. It allows you to get fit at the same time. Bringing public art to Hastings Park is part of a master plan City Council adopted in 2010. This particular piece was first pitched nine years ago. It's the work of Seattle artists Annie Han and Daniel Mahalio. In the intro to that story, I tried to describe the thing 
in the the news piece, we heard them try to describe the thing, but I feel like someone listening still would not be able to like visualize in their head what this is. Do you want to take a stab at explaining what this thing looks like? Yeah, stairs. Yeah, it looks like so. <laughs> it there's like get more complicated than that. Well, stairs and bleachers because it's kind of like on on the okay. So there's a big field with like I don't know a soccer field or something there. Um, then there is this metal structure that climbs, uh, I guess it was like 15, 17 meters or something on the right side is stairs on the left side is like bleachers. So seats. Yeah. But the bleachers also look like stairs. Yeah. Just bigger stairs. So if you're short, you would go on the right side. If you're left, you'd go up the yeah, left yeah. side. It's and, just a lot of stairs. Yeah. And then there's a guardrail like through the center, dividing the stairs from the bleachers and then kind of guardrails on each side, preventing people from falling a considerable drop. So they're untimely and uh, humiliating death. It looks like they hired some artist somewhere. It's like, we want an installation to represent the history of the area um you know can you can you do something interesting for us and then they come up with a project and it's like you know hideous and 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 there's a big argument about um a big argument about like oh the you know, the integrity of the piece and they can't come to terms over price and then the, the artist you don't respect my art and then the artist storms out of the office and then the the project is canceled and it's like well we still want some stairs, so then just got a general contractor to build them some stairs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it does look like a, an art installation done by a general contractor that typically designs stadium seating for outdoor. Yeah, like just regular stairs. And then, because like you said, there's not really anything interesting visually about it. You know what it looks like? exactly like is you know when you're in a warehouse and you have those stairs on ladders mm -hmm. or stairs on wheels mm -hmm. you know that when you have to say you, that you climb up to reach high boxes yeah. that's what this thing looks exactly like except exactly. there's no wheels <laughs> and they're exceptionally high mm -hmm. yeah and you can fall to your death from it uh now this you know we're, we're kind of criticizing the artistic merit and uh, value of this piece this has been over 10 years in the making that this was originally proposed and be, the, the discussions to put this up started in like 2009. Uh, it was approved 10 years ago, initially with a budget of $450,000. And what I know about the world is if 10 years ago, they're like, we'll spend $450,000. That's probably climbed to six or $700,000 at this point. So this is a very expensive set of stairs in a park in Vancouver. I would I would suggest that a city like Vancouver probably has more worthwhile things to spend at least four hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars on. I'd also suggest looking at the design first before you okay the project. So that when the artist comes into your office, you know, you're the mayor or whoever you are, and <laughs> you're the person who approves dumb projects. Um so the artist comes in and and they're like, okay, you know, let's see your designs. What did you come up with? And he's like, I present to you stairs. And then they look at the drawings and they're like, well, yeah, that's pretty literal. They're just stairs. <laughs> yes, that's that's exactly right. Can you imagine people seeing the stairs and this, and then you stare at the stairs and then you climb the stairs and then you push your husband off of the stairs that's probably very likely how it went down i will say though um i did do a bit of research on this uh the original proposal that was approved for four hundred and fifty thousand was very different than the final the final product the original design was two separate sets of stairs that kind of met at the top one set of stairs was painted blue the other would have been painted red and it represented a home team and an away team. Because again, this the, scup, the sculpture is called Home and Away. So originally it was like two stairs, I get two sets of stairs meant to represent the two teams or whatever. Somehow that got merged into one giant set of stairs that was only one color. Um, the, the name Home and Away maybe is less relevant and calling it a stairway to nowhere is probably quite appropriate. Uh, let's uh, let's break up this with a little bit of listener mail. Uh, we're continuing to receive voicemails related to the timeless prank known by us as Nicky Nicky Nine Door, 
but apparently it goes by a variety of names and we've gotten two actually i think we got more than two voicemails over this past week with people weighing in on what it's called in their community i'm going to play two of them here two of the voicemails and i will warn you in some communities nikki nikki nine door has a horribly offensive name that i've never heard of but it exists uh, let's first hear from steven on nikki nikki nine door hi guys this is steven from the annapolis valley I was trying to look up the uh, word uh, Nikki for the Nikki Nikki Nine Doors um, situation. And there's no real meaning for the word Nikki. It's just a word that they use. Um, uh, I used to know it as uh, knock on ginger or knock knock ginger. Um, it's just different words that, uh, that they... Uh, came up with throughout the years, but no specific meanings to them. So there you go. Yeah, it has a different name everywhere. I appreciate him trying to do some research. I tried to figure it out as well. I had no yeah. luck. And I'm, I'm not allowed here. to Google, so I cannot help anybody out in this situation. If I don't currently know the answer, I'm not finding it out. But I'd like to, I'd like to connect with Stephen on a deeper level for a moment, if you don't mind. Please. The floor is yours. Well, Stephen is from the Annapolis Valley, and I have deep, deep apple seed roots in Annapolis Valley. Oh, that's news to me. That's where my that's where my father is from. Okay, he was born and raised in the Annapolis Valley, and that's where I spent all my summers growing up as a child. Okay. Is uh, visiting my grandmother in the Annapolis Valley, knocking on her door and taking off. No, I knock on her door; she lets me in. Okay. But not anymore. She's dead. Oh, let's hear another one. Um, this one, like viewer or listener discretion. And in some areas, some horrible places, Nikki Nikki Nindor has a much more offensive and disturbing undertone. Hi, this is Tristan Kirkpatrick calling from Portland, Oregon. Um, as far as the uh, name Nikki Nikki Nindors goes, uh, I've never heard it called that before. Um, but in America, I've heard it called something. Uh, very unfortunate and racist which is um let's say n-word knocking and uh i hope that that's not the root of your nikki nikki nine doors name uh have a good day bye i will say i heard that voicemail and i thought like there's no way people would call it that and with a bit of research i realized throughout some parts of the united states that's what people refer to it and had referred to it as which is another wow. reason I don't want to ever go there. Hopefully the what we call it doesn't have an an I don't, underlying racial context to it that would be unfortunate. I don't think so. I think it's completely unrelated. I think um ugh. I don't know. Uh, hopefully they don't call it that anymore and maybe they could um fall back on some of the other names for it um what was the what was the other one there was nikki nikki nine doors but then there was another one that they used in the article ding dong ditch ding dong ditch <laughs> there it is yes yeah. yeah ding dong ditch that is much more suitable if you've ever heard of it by a derogatory name i'd say take note of where that person lives show up at their home late at night Put a bag of burning dog poop on their doorstep and pull a ding dong ditch and get out of there. Sound fair? And then leave a card saying it's called ding dong ditch. It has come to my attention that a pretty Keep Canada weird appropriate court decision was made just this past week in a courtroom in British Columbia. And we got to talk about it. This involves... A weekend, a weekend vacation, a date and relationship gone wrong, and cold play tickets. And the whole thing ends, as I said, in a courtroom. I have an article here. Do you want to read it? Uh, yes, I would be happy to read the article. We'll call it the cold play date lawsuit. Absolutely. A weekend vacation mixed with a bitter breakup led to a lawsuit over cold play tickets. 
Miss Alyssa Randalls of BC had been ordered to repay her ex, Mr. Michael uh, Stolfi, $450 related to a dispute over tickets for a two, uh, 2023 Coldplay concert in Vancouver, according to a recent small claims court decision. This case highlights the legal differences between gifts and loans under Canadian law. Oh. In September 2023, Miss Randalls and Mr. Stofi attended a Coldplay concert in Vancouver, which cost $450 per ticket. After a falling out, Mr. Stofi took Miss Randalls to court, seeking $600 in total reimbursement, which included the ticket cost plus additional expenses for their hotel, meals, and taxis. Miss mm. Randalls argued that the ticket was a gift rather than a loan. Under Canadian law, proving a gift requires showing that the giver intended it as a gift and that the recipient accepted it as such. The court found Miss Randalls failed to meet this burden of proof. The court heard that Miss Randalls had purchased the tickets through her own Ticketmaster account, but Mr. Stofi had e-transferred her $900 shortly after. Mr. Stofi claimed that Randalls promised to repay her half of the cost uh, on her next payday and miss randall's did not provide compelling evidence to dispute this claim the court concluded that the coldplay ticket was not a gift but a loan however the tribunal did not grant mr stofi's request for reimbursement of additional expenses such as meals and a hotel stay due to insufficient evidence of a verbal agreement to split these costs the tribunal also noted Mr. Stofi's aggressive behavior regarding the dispute. A text message exchange showed Mr. Stofi at one point demanded $1,000 for Miss Randalls <laughs> and that she refused to pay, leading Stofi to become increasingly aggressive. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stofi at one point gave Randalls one week to repay the $1,000, then in the same conversation, shortened the deadline to two days, then shortened it again <laughs> to 5 p.m. that day. <laughs> The exchange, including threats to contact Randall's landlord, employer, and family to secure payment, which led Randall's to involve the Vancouver police. Mm. While Randall's acknowledged agreeing to repay the ticket costs, she did not agree to specific terms, which contributed to the tribunal's decision. In the end, the court... The courts rejected Mr. Stofi's claims for extra expenses, yet Miss Randalls was ordered to repay $450 for the ticket, plus approximately $81 in pre-judgment interest and court fees. Wow. That's a great cherry on top of a nasty breakup. A court case over Coldplay tickets, hotel expenses, and cab fare? Yeah, and I imagine he represented himself in court because can you imagine hiring a lawyer to try and get four hundred and fifty dollars plus additional expenses yeah well, well he wanted 600 well he wanted a thousand in his arguments with her yeah yeah <laughs> and i and i love that like you got a week you got two days if i don't get it by five tomorrow i'm calling your landlord yeah i'm calling your boss like <laughs> what's your boss gonna do <laughs> yeah you owe someone money you're fired <laughs> And this organization, we pay for our own Coldplay tickets. <laughs> um, it, this was a small claims court kind of thing. And I think that's usually you're usually or often self-represented with it being six, a six hundred dollar dispute. I'm guessing both of them probably were self-represented in. She in the end she had to pay for her Coldplay ticket the four hundred and fifty bucks plus eighty one dollars in like other expenses. I'm thinking some of those other expenses would have been like if he took her to court, there was probably costs to even like you know book the time in the court. Maybe well, there's a there's a there's a cost to just filing uh, the claim in, without in a lawyer claims. or anything like yeah, just without a lawyer it. involved i think there's like a a hundred dollar fee or something like that so that's probably like that 81 dollars is probably some of that stuff like it's just probably little... just the fee to to set up you know to to uh, to uh, apply to take someone to small claims court so yeah. um yeah it's but again just the physical effort to go through this, I would, I really want to know what happened in the breakup because the only motivation I could see 
someone doing this for is not financial, but purely over spite. It has to be. It has yeah. to be. I, I think like I've like so many people, there'll be this nasty breakup and just whatever is kind of just dangling in front of them left unresolved, they just use as like weapons to whip each other with. So that could be like custody of kids. It could be ownership of homes and properties, or it could be something as simple as like, I don't know, Coldplay tickets in a vague unresolved debt related to them. Like if you break up with someone and in the end, you owe them or they owe you $450. I think most reasonable people would just be like, ah, that $450 is not worth it. Yeah, like I done. never would have taken uh, an X to small claims court over $600 or Life's even $1,000. Like, I'm not going to I'm not going to spend the the effort, the physical effort to do that. Or and the mental effort, like just to have to deal with it. Yeah, just the, just everything that comes along with going to small claims court, taking somebody there, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a lot of work, and for six hundred bucks, for four hundred and fifty bucks, like it's got to be for at least a couple of grand, you know, yeah. if you're going for something. Yeah, and I get different amounts of money uh, mean more to some people than others, but I think. Regardless, like I don't think this was worth anybody's time financially. This to me screams like just bad breakup and them using this cold play tickets and related expenses as just, again, like a weapon to slap each other with. Yeah, and the article doesn't go into the personal details of the relationship. So I would like to know a lot more about where they met, you know, how long they were together for. Why they broke uh, up. How Why was they the broke up? Like, there's, yeah. And was how, it worth four hundred fifty? How long after the concert did they break up? Like, how long were they together after the concert? Or did they break up at the concert? Exactly. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Well, I don't These know. Some people say to know. You know, like traveling. I don't think they were from Vancouver because they had a hotel room, so they would have had to travel there. And for some like relationships, especially if it's a new relationship and you haven't spent a lot of time alone together, going on a vacation for the weekend to a city like Vancouver, that could be a bit of a pressure cooker. And you really learn who you're with when you're dealing with flights and delays and hotels and thing, getting cabs and. Yeah, maybe just in the middle of this, he's like, you know what, she is, a, or he or she thought about the other he or she thinking like, this person is a nightmare. Like, I'm not, we're done after this. I don't want to go through this again. It's ruined the concert. I spent $450 to see this band and he or she has just been like bothering me the whole time. I'm done. And uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you and I traveled to Toronto together uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I'm actually taking you to small claims court. Exactly. I'm not like, I'm not paying you for the Uber we got. Yeah, but I have a record of the Uber transaction on my Uber account. I'm going to be using that as evidence. Okay. I have a witness. Um, our friend Randy Stonewall will be a witness of mine. Okay. And uh, I want that $17. Okay. You and I have a legal dispute. This couple had a legal dispute. But neither are the only ugly disputes that are playing out in the public eye. My favorite dispute of the week is not the Coldplay tickets. It's not uh, mine and your Uber dispute. It's a little thing playing out in Newfoundland that I call the barbershop drama. I don't know how to introduce this, but to say that a, a photo of a sign in a barbershop in St. John's, Newfoundland is going viral across the internet because of the the wording on the sign calling out a competitor a neighboring barber shop i'm not going to tell you too much about it just yet but i will tell you that many people have sent me photos of this sign and suggest that we cover it on keep canada weird um we did some real i did some real investigative journalism here i'm not just going to read you the sign i got in touch with the person who took the photo of the sign and published it. And uh, they agreed to come on the show for a, a short segment here to tell us a little bit about the barbershop drama that's playing out in St. John's, Newfoundland. Carrie Claire is joining us now to tell us about it. Here it comes. Carrie, I've been looking for ages for a correspondent from St. John's, Newfoundland, because I knew weird stuff happened there. I finally found one in you, and you come in hot with probably the best story from St. John's, Newfoundland that this show has ever seen. Yet it's a mystery. Tell me about what happened. 
Yeah, hi. Um, I was um, walking from work the other day uh, to get a coffee. And, you know, I consider myself a very observant person, you know, a Sherlock Holmes. Mm. Some might call me nosy. Um, but <laughs> I noticed uh, this barbershop across the road had a little sign in their window. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I stopped to read it. Do you read, and, every, do you read every sign? Of course. You know, I want to know what's happening okay. around me. Sure. Um, I'm a real community activist, so I want to stay in touch okay. <laughs> with my neighbors. And um, yeah, I, uh, I snapped a little picture and posted it on Twitter because I thought, you know, Twitter, Twitter loves drama. So I had to do my service and let everyone in on, I guess, the barbershop feud that's been happening. Uh, and, and that's what it seems to be, is that a, bar a feud between rival barbershops, I guess, seems to have poured over into the public realm. So the sign, I have a copy here. The sign says, and I, I like that the sign is, um, it's, it's just posted in, in a, a white piece of paper with black text posted in the window. You can see in the glass, the re your reflection smiling, taking a picture of it. And it, the sign says, imagine not having enough common sense to know it's unethical to be the first barbershop in Newfoundland's history to relocate your shop next door to an existing barbershop. You should be ashamed of yourself. So was this sign in the window of the barbershop with the competing barbershop next door? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's maybe two doors down, but I'm sure they were aware. Um, <laughs> it did get taken down like the next day. Do you um, think that's as a result of your post? Because, you know, people say this is viral, that's viral. You posted this and it, for all intents and purposes, has gone viral, has it not? Yeah, I mean, by the next day, like 5,000 people had liked it, which means everyone in Newfoundland had seen it. <laughs> um, so I'm sure, you know, word probably got back to him and um, people weren't like, you know, I'm always the nicest on Twitter. So maybe, okay. yeah, he was a little shamed into okay. taking it to him. And uh, you happened upon this weird story leaving the, uh, when, after you walked away from a relatively weird place, you were coming out of a comic book shop. Tell me, tell me about where you were coming from. Yeah, I run a little comic book store in downtown St. John's, uh, aptly called Downtown Comics. Um, I would say we're kind of like a femme punk comic game bookstore. Okay, cool. Is is there any kind of infighting or drama that you can share? Like, are there rival comic book shops that you want taken out? Or is this pretty healthy and happy? It's funny. So my dad started the business like 25 years ago. And he actually started his store across the road from a comic book <laughs> store. <laughs> it's um, happening so, again. <laughs> you know, downtown St. John's is not very large. Um, so, you know, there's only so much real estate. Okay. Um, so, you know, yeah. For people who want to see your photo, where do they find this? Yeah, you can find me at Carrie Claire Neal um, for all the, you know, Newfoundland pet, petty drama that you need in your life. <laughs> okay, so you don't get into like really nasty stuff like divorces and such. You just want like local businesses putting up like uh, condescending signs, maybe someone rolling their eyes. Is that what they'll find in your, your feed? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I do call out kind of institutions a lot too for, oh. you know, being corrupt and uh, okay. taking down the people. But okay. so just follow me for that too. <laughs> I like this kind of drama. Uh, a public sign shaming a competitor. That's interesting to me. It reminds me a little bit about a story we covered in the past, the Glace Bay chicken shop. That was different though, because it was like manager versus employees and it was playing out on Facebook. This is just a barbershop putting up a sign in the window, calling out a competitor for moving a little too close for comfort. Is that unethical? I don't know if I'd say it's unethical. Um, I, I, it's, I it was certainly as the barbershop owner that was there first, I would be very frustrated with that. Mm -hmm. If a competitor opened up two doors down from me, especially when I've been the only barbershop downtown for how many years? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Super frustrating. Is it unethical? No, I don't think so. It's business. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to, you want to be downtown. Uh, you're allowed to, to rent out some real estate and, and move in and open up whatever business you want, as long as it's within the legal constraints of the law. Yeah. And, and so this 
person is allowed to do that, that when you go down the street, there are multiple restaurants that people can choose from that whenever you see like a big grocery store on the other side of the street, there's another grocery store, you know, they open up next to each other all the time. So basically it boils down to who cuts the best hair Mm -hmm. and competition always makes everyone better. So I think it's for the, for the long-term better good that this old barbershop now has new competition because now they have to step up their game. Mm-hmm. I think anyone with hair in St. John's, Newfoundland benefits. I agree. And the prices will go down a little bit. Uh, the quality will go up. That's what Twice happens when, yeah, when you have competition. Twice as many appointments available. Uh, and it's a, for the business owners, whether or not it's unethical or whatever, it's a double-edged sword because if you're going to start a business or move your business to a spot where there's somebody already established, if that established barbershop that's already there is making everyone in that area happy, it's going to be a real uphill battle as the new barbershop in town to try to win those customers over. So... Mm. The original barbershop that put this sign up, to me, that's a sign of fear. Like maybe that barbershop knows things aren't great and their clients are probably willing to take a chance with the new shop. Like if not, you know, if they knew they were making everyone happy and they had the market locked down, why would they even care? Why would they bother showing off this ugly sign? Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, if this, if this new barbershop was really undercutting the old barbershop, like maybe say they're both on par quality wise with the standards of their cuts. But, um, but the new barbershop was offering haircuts for $15 less than the other barbershop. Mm -hmm. That would be a bit of a greasy move. Yeah. That, yeah, I could see that being, that'd be a whole different story altogether. But, and who knows, maybe that's the case. This new barbershop could have a, you know, whoever runs it, maybe their parents have deep pockets and they're willing to operate the thing at a loss just to shut the original one down. And yeah, I would say that's on, well, not even unethical. That's business, but it's just kind of the dark side of it. But just one thing I want to touch on. I don't know if we've talked about this. Uh, speaking of like businesses, like undercutting each other and um, in feuds or whatever between businesses, we talk about Tim Horton a lot but i don't think we've talked about the fact that mcdonald's have has just uh, announced that they're offering coffee not a not a promotional price like from now on a small coffee is just one dollar which pretty much cuts tim horton's price in half like mccafe mcdonald's coffee arm is going hard at tim horton's price was. yeah and i fully support it mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I, I was in PEI over the last few days, there's a lot more Robin's Donuts there than there is in Nova Scotia. I've went to Robin's Donuts several times and I noticed they're also coming for Tim Hortons. Robin's Donuts were selling flatbread pizzas, flatbread pizzas. I didn't buy one, but looking at the photos, they look great. And I also noticed on the shirts, uh, the uniforms that the Robin's Donuts employees were wearing, it said like, you know, Tim's say their their slogans kind of like always fresh, which people dispute because they make their food somewhere and then like chill it and ship it across the country. So it's not necessarily fresh. Robin's Donuts had something about like baked fresh every day, made in can or like Canadian owned and made fresh every day or something like it was a, a clear like mm. shot at Tim Horton's um, international ownership and no longer making stuff fresh in, in store. So well, there, are bit, Robin's, there are disputes all over. Robin's Donuts was making those flatbread pizzas long before Tim started selling their mm-hmm. flatbread pizzas. Okay. They just made it more prominent on the menu now, maybe in response. Well, no. I mean, like every time I go, because I go to Robin's a lot. There's a Robin's just up the street from me. Um, so I go to Robin's all the time. And when you go through the drive through at Robin's, pr- Prominently featured for a few years now have been these flatbread pizzas. Oh, interesting. You know, yeah. I'm just going to talk out loud here, but I would love to work out something with Robin's Donuts. Where Me maybe too. They... I love Robin's. Yeah, I've been a big supporter of Robin's for most of my life. Okay. If anyone in Robin's corporate is listening to this, we are the cheapest ambassadors you will ever find. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. We've talked about a lot of weird Canadian news stories from the past week, but... Tonight, I really want to end with like a a breath of fresh air, a kind of palate cleanser. This story is not necessarily weird, but 
two things make it relevant tonight. One is I done you dirty over the last few weeks by playing a series of stories relating to animals being injured and it got to the point that you had to stop me you recall a conversation we had a couple weeks back where you you had enough of it dogs and animals being attacked and we also so that's one side of it but we've also claimed that anytime a cat is in the news in canada we will talk about it we have no choice but to discuss the story of trooper the stray cat if there was ever a kitty that has lived up to his name, it's this little guy. When he came, he was named Socks, and I was like, no, nah, this guy's a little trooper. He's a trooper. <laughs> Rescued from a barn by strays of Sussex in New Brunswick, little trooper still had the will to play, but not the use of his legs. He couldn't lift his backside, even to stand to eat, so we had to put the food down bottom. He couldn't get in and out of the litter box. Trooper's future looked grim. In all honesty, we thought we were going to be doing a euthanasia. Unwilling to give up on the little guy, Terry Peck took Trooper to Kitty Cairo, only to discover that it was a damaged nerve and not a broken back, limiting his limbs. Are you doing kitty physio? I am. Oh my God. <laughs> One, two. It just might be the most adorable physio session ever witnessed. I know. This feline now has quite the following. He does his exercises four times a day and sometimes he doesn't want to do them. <laughs> yes, you get mad at me and kick them as much as you want. Come on. And he is living up to his newfound name. <laughs> now he can actually walk for a few steps and play a little bit. Kitten foster Sue Fryadair, who struggles with her own mobility, says Trooper will still need lots of therapy lots to grow stronger. Therapy. But the community is rallying around the little fellow with special needs, even donating a wheelchair soon to arrive to help with his rehab. He's going to get the best care and the best start, and we'll take it from there, and he'll find a forever home that's good for him. It's going to be a wonderful story. We're rewriting his future. I believe in miracles. What a little trooper. Shelley Steves, Global News, Sussex, New Brunswick. How does that make you feel? Oh, wonderful. It's uh, it's nice to have an animal story that makes you feel good on this show. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't much weird about it. Although like a cat in a wheelchair is kind of, I've never seen that well, before. I mean, cat physio is, I've never heard I wouldn't of say it's weird, but it's definitely not Maybe something you hear about a lot. It's offbeat. Yeah, it's offbeat. Yeah, but, but it's it's a good ad for physio because if you watch that video, the that news clip, uh, in the beginning of the news clip, the cat is just like its its back legs are completely done, like it's not doing anything, and then later on, there's videos of the cat like taking a few steps. So it seems like the physio is working. Oh no, it definitely looks like he's improved immensely, and. If you're ever in a bad mood or you're feeling down or depressed, then Google this news footage and watch it and you'll feel great at the end of it. Yeah, I feel good. I feel great. I, I, I feel really good now. Yeah. So that cat's a real trooper. Um, now, that was supposed to be the palate cleanser we go out on, but there's one voicemail I got that I, I saved for the last. It's... It's a bit of a mystery to me because I'm not necessarily sure what they're referencing and your memory is better than mine. Um, maybe this is just straight up harassment and it's um, hate mail. I don't know what to make of this voicemail. It's unlike any we've ever gotten before though. I want to play it for you and I hope you can explain it to me. What is this all about? Lincoln Logs, Lincoln Logs, Jordan, will you play with me? Lincoln Logs, Lincoln Logs, Aaron, you're so sweet. Love you guys. <laughs> does that mean what does he? Good? What does he say at the end? I love you guys. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> that's that a nice voicemail then. <laughs> does it mean anything to you? Lincoln Logs is, is poop. No, I thought Lincoln Logs were a toy. They're like wooden, like... Oh my God. I was just about to go. I was just reaching for my keyboard to go and Ooh. Google and I oh, stopped yeah. myself. Thank you. Um, and Pat from Peterborough. Thanks you. Uh, yeah, Lincoln yeah. Logs that are... was like a muscle memory thing. Like my fingers flew right to the keyboards, but um, Lincoln, Lincoln logs, logs are, it's poop. I know it as a toy where you well, can kind of play pile with poop. 
You're maybe, admitting it right now on on live on on Keep Canada Weird. Okay. You no, play it's, with it's, your own feces. I promise you, when we're done the show and the restrictions are removed from your hands and keyboards, when you Google Lincoln Logs, you'll see that they're a popular toy that uh, it's like little wood that's stackable and you can make things out of them. Uh, I don't understand the reference in that voicemail. I do appreciate the absurdity of it, though. The voice, the timbre of how they're singing this bizarre little song. Maybe it means yeah, something like to it. someone. Lincoln Logs, Lincoln, Lincoln Logs. logs. <laughs> I can't remember the rest of the words. <laughs> Jordan, won't you play with me? Jordan, Lincoln Logs, Lincoln Logs. You Aaron, you're so me. nice. Yeah, I like that song a lot. <laughs> Although I'm pretty sure it's about poop. Okay. Well, who knows? Let's wrap this up, though. I think we've accomplished our task of highlighting the weird and offbeat news stories from the past week. We've found a whole bunch of new correspondents, including Carrie in St. John's, Newfoundland, who took some time out of their day as a comic book store um, entrepreneur. entrepreneur to break down a local story. I like that sort of thing. So let's put a bow on this. Uh, Handsome Aaron Airport, until next time. Jordan, until next time. If any local business wrongs you, uh, put up a cool sign. That'll get their attention. Yeah. Well, Jordan, until next time, if anyone wrongs you, just call them up and make up a song about them. Lincoln Logs, Lincoln Logs, Jordan plays with Lincoln Logs. Uh, Aaron doesn't because he is an outstanding citizen. <laughs> but Jordan plays with Lincoln Logs because he is gross. Oh my God. I want to thank you for helping Aaron and I fulfill our mission to keep Canada weird, but let us also call out to you for even greater support in this work. If something weird happens in your neck of the woods, we want to hear about it. As well, if you have any thoughts, theories, or opinions on anything we discussed tonight, we want to hear about that as well. The best way to reach us is by sending a voice memo using the built-in voice recorder that can be found at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. And to sweeten the deal for you a little bit, if your voice is aired on the show, you qualify for a Keep Canada Weird swag pack. So once you hear your voice message played, all you got to do is email me at nighttimepodcast at gmail.com. Give me your mailing address and I'll have it out to you right away. Aaron and I are excited to hear from you. Now, before we part, let me end with some thanks. First, a big thanks to Aaron for sharing another evening with me and with you, the listeners of Nighttime. A big shout out to the internet's favorite cult leader, Unicole, who provides the intro and outro voiceovers for this series, and Monty Data, who provides the outro version of O Canada. And then lastly, but most importantly, a massive thanks goes out to each and every one of you listening to Nighttime, as without your interest and your support, this show would be as pointless as it would be impossible. On the topic of support, let me thank the newest subscribers to the premium feed. Marcia, Jacqueline, and Alia, thank you for going premium. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show, you can help us out here in a variety of ways. First of all, a premium feed subscription costs just a couple dollars a month, and that money funds the creation of new episodes. But the premium feed will also give you those episodes two days early, give them to you ad-free, and give you access to a full back catalog of episodes. If that sounds like something you're interested in, you can go premium right now at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And even if you don't want to go premium, you can still support the growth of the show by sharing this episode on social media and letting all your like-minded friends know why they should listen. Your support is very much appreciated. Now, until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let us know if you see anything weird. Keep Canada Weird is written, hosted, and produced by the Nighttime Podcast. And now to our viewers and listeners everywhere. Good night. We have to end with a brief discussion here about our favorite story of the night. Um, for mine, the most Keep Canada Weird story of the night is going to be Vancouver's Stairway to Nothing. Uh, visually, it's absurd. When you hear the background and the explanation, none of it really makes sense. It's in the center of a park in Vancouver for the city to see and just gawk at. It's stupid and dangerous. Um, the Vancouver Stairway to Nothing, to me, is an expensive 
and risky act of keeping Canada weird by the city of Vancouver. What's yours? My most keep Canada weird story would be the Coldplay tickets. Okay. What did you um, like about it? Oh, I've never heard of any couple going to, like, after breaking up, going to small claims court over such a minimal thing. <laughs> and like, and yeah, and usually it's like, you know, too. yeah, like, it's usually it's expensive property that you're fighting over, but. A car, and, you know, we bought the car together, and I paid all the financing, and now she's taking the car, and. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah. $8,000. Not yeah. like. And, and how long did they date for? If. Yeah, there's so many questions I have about it. I think it would kind of really could be peeled back into a really interesting story if we have more of the details. It must have been a short relationship. Maybe this was their only date because if they dated if they dated for any length of time and they were this petty at the end of it, it wouldn't just be lot like small claims court over this one weekend in Vancouver. No, they would like, have would had be... to have dated for at least like six months or something for it to have this kind of heat. You would think, but if they did date for six months, there would be other issues aside from the Coldplay tickets and in debt related to that one weekend. You know, there would be more but to Maybe it. they kept their finances so separate, like so 50-50. And, and they took the one chance to that weekend kind of blend yeah. it together. He's all like, all. I just can't put together a Ticketmaster account. Can I use yours? <laughs> That's <laughs> what's so rest. weird about that story too, is why do they have to use her Ticketmaster account? Just set one up when you're buying the tickets. It, like, it takes like seconds. Could you not just buy it as a you guest? You do it in the time? process, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know. It's, uh, there's so many aspects that make that such a weird story. But my favorite story is cat physiotherapy. Hmm.